but Christianity is not just about coming to church a couple times a month. Uh, Christianity is lived out 24 hours a day. So that's what we're talking about today is full-time Christianity. And we're going to start out with uh, talking about full-time worship. So turn to Romans 12, verse 1, and that's 1747. So think of a 747, uh, and it's 1,747. By the way, how many of you have been on a 747 before? Aren't they, those are wonderful planes. They get uh, like negative 10 miles per gallon, and uh, yeah, so they don't use them much anymore. But Romans 12:1. So worship. We have a really bad view of worship. So when we talk about worship, what do we think worship is? Romans 12:1, 1747. Worship is what we do in 8 or 10.30 in the church, right? That's, that's worship. Um, look at God's definition of worship. Uh, verse, so Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So how does God define worship? Because it's not just going to a worship service. How does he define uh, worship? Yeah, it's, you know, uh, offering our bodies as living sacrifices. Um, and we're looking at Romans 12.1, Mark, and that's on 1747. Um, not like Jesus did, not to giving our bodies into death, but to use our bodies, our life, for something, for him. Um, so, it, and what I like to make you think about is the, the word worship me, comes from the word worthship. It's an old English word, worthship. And by worthship, you show how much someone is worth to you. So, for example, I did write this to Denise once. This is when I was living in Montana. She was living in Indiana. And I got some of those great poetry books, and, uh, you know, and then I copied them. I didn't tell her that someone else wrote them. But, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Because um, it was my thoughts. So I, but one of them I wrote, um, I would cross the hottest desert for you. I'd climb the highest mountain for you. I'd swim the deepest ocean for you, you know. Um, P.S. I'll call you on Tuesday if I don't get too busy. <laughs> now, if you climb the highest mountain to help someone, that would be, you, you can see how much they're worth to you, right? Worship is how people can see what God is worth to us. And, and if it's just a going to church Sunday morning thing, then quite honestly, God is not worth all that much to you. It's 24 hours a day, every aspect of our lives. I like to think of, uh, you think of a bicycle wheel where you got the hub and then you got all those spokes going off the hub. The hub of our life is Jesus Christ. And we want every aspect of our life to be connected to that hub. That's what life is all about. And so worship then isn't just about going to a church service, although that certainly is part of it. Um, Worship is what we do throughout each and every day. Worship is the choices we make about what to do, about what not to do, about what to say, about what not to say. Worship is expressed in all kinds of different ways. And that, that's kind of the key thought, if, if you think about it. Worship is far more than just that, that good habit of going to church. And by the way, I'm not discouraging going to church because Jesus had commanded us to remember the Sabbath day. So that is part of showing worship what Jesus is worth to us when we obey his commands. But so is all the rest of the stuff. So is that loving each other as Christ loves us. Uh, so is, um, all right, let's, let's just think about this for a little bit. Full-time Christianity. How can you show your faith in the way you drive? And I'm not holding myself up as a perfect example of this. So theoretically, how could you show your faith um, in Jesus Christ? That's connect, we want it connected to the hub. So how would we drive if we we're going to show faith? Follow, yeah, you'd go the speed limit. What's that? Yes, with courtesy. So 
You ever notice you see sometimes cars that are waiting, that have been waiting a long time to pull out? Um, at the truck stop, well, I always go past the truck stop on the way back and forth to the church. And you know what? Sometimes I stop and just let those trucks go. And that's hard for me because I'm always trying to get home. Come on, I've got to set a new record time. But that's, you know, that when I'm wearing my clerical, I drive a whole lot nicer than I do the rest of the time. Um, but yeah, how we drive is when I was living in Montana. Montana, by the way, did not have a speed limit for a lot of years. Now, they had a speed limit at night. Uh, but during the daytime, whatever you wanted to do, because it's, it's like hours between little tiny towns in Montana. There's nothing to hit. I guess mountains, but you can avoid those pretty easy, too. But um, so then um, came the uh, oil crisis way back. You remember that? And uh, so then they came up with a federal speed limit. And it's not that the states control speed limits. It's not a federal issue. But the federal government said, if you don't have a 55 mile an hour speed limit, we're not going to give you federal dollars to use on your highways. So Montana got a 55 mile an hour speed limit. Um, and, but here's how they did it, because they were pretty defiant. They said, it's, I, I got one of those tickets once, I have to be honest. Um, and it was, uh, I got a, a $10 fine for an uneconomical use of a national resource, uh, I, you know, because uh, I was going too fast. Um, you, you, he gave you an envelope, you put your check in, put it in the mail, you're done. No points, no anything. Trucker said, that's just cost of doing business, you know. <laughs> they figure if they get caught twice a week, that's 20 bucks, no points accumulated. But I would, uh, in my youthful, rebellious days, I would uh, drive way over the speed limit in Montana. And um, when we had pastor's conferences, and uh, all of western Montana and part of Idaho was where the churches that met together were, because there weren't that many churches out in the middle of, you know, the Rocky Mountains. And so we, we'd drive a couple hours usually to get to the place we were meeting. And um, I'd always pass this one pastor in, from a nearby town, and, and one time he said to me, uh, you know, um, that, that uh, obey the governing authorities part, he said that applies to speed limit too. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> now he said it with a smile on his face. I still don't like him. <laughs> but you know, that, isn't that true? But the way I drive, I can show my relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, think of a work situation. All right. how, how does uh, faith show in the way you work at your job? It can. What? The way you deal with other people, and you know, one, you're nice to them, you know, so what else? Yeah. You, you actually do your job. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, what a novel concept. So that if you're getting paid for an hour of work, you work for that hour. You, if you get a 15-minute break, take good, take your 15-minute break, but work hard. I worked in a furniture factory in Grable, Indiana, um, and half the people, when the foreman, who was my father-in-law, that's the only reason I got hired for to work in a furniture factory, because I'm not super skilled on all those machines by any means. But um, when... Uh, Half the people, when my father-in-law left the wood shop, which was in a separate building from the main part, they would stop working. And one of them would go stand by the window and watch. So as soon as he came back, he'd give the warning, and uh, uh, then they'd start to work. And it was interesting. There was about five of us that just kept working. And all five were Christians. Because we weren't just working for a paycheck. We are working to bring glory to God. You know? Full-time Christianity. That's the concept. So for right now, we're going to talk about the worship service, though, just a little bit. Um, so in a worship service, where is worship going on? I mean, we call it that, but where, how do we show worship in a worship service? Um, singing can be, right? By the way, um, you ever notice communion takes a long time at the Lutheran Church? Especially St. John's, right? The 8 o'clock service this morning, I think we we're like five minutes after 9 o'clock. We we're always supposed to end by 9 o'clock. That's an unwritten rule. 
and boy, I violated it, I guess. Yeah, we got to have time to eat, otherwise we can't start Bible study class, you know. Got to got to do that. But um people ask, "Well, what, you know, what am I supposed to do after I take communion?" You could sing hymns to who? To Jesus. You know, that so singing can be part of worship. Um what else? Actually, the stuff we do before and after is part of worship, too, because when you show love for God's people, whatever you do for the least of these, my brothers, you do for me. So that is, that is an important part of worship, is uh, the, the stuff we do with each other. What else? All right, let's think of this. In a worship service, there are two things going on. One, God is reaching down to us to do things for us, and the other is we're reaching out to God with worship. So what are things that God is doing for us in a worship service? Think about that. Now, Holy Spirit is at work. And in, in what parts of the service is God reaching out to us? The words of the absolution, if you don't hear that as God, then you're missing the point. Because, you know, if, if you're thinking, well, Pastor Johnson, he can't forgive my sins. My sins weren't against him. And by the way, I've had a couple people chastised me for saying that. And I said, you need to look at uh, what Jesus said about the power of the keys, that when, whenever we announce forgiveness to someone, that's God saying it. But um, yeah, so absolution is God saying something to you, God reaching out to you. What else? Yeah, scripture readings. That's God reaching out to us, to, to teach us, to guide us, to Tell, fill us uh, with his promises and words of love and forgiveness. So that's that's God thing. Uh, words, the readings, and absolution, what else? Um, prayer is going to come back in a different way. All right, so what else is uh, God coming down to us? Com All right, good. I was hoping if you guys didn't get that, I was going to chastise you. Yeah. Because, yeah, communion, that's God coming. That's Jesus coming saying, hey, you want proof that I forgive you? Here's proof. Here's my body given for you. Here's my blood shed for you. So we got communion, we got the readings, and we got words of absolution. Where else does God come to us in the worship? What's that? Absolutely. And I think a lot of people miss that. I did for many years. I thought the, um, the benediction meant finally we're done. Yeah, <laughs> just got one hymn, and then we're out of here, and I can go watch the Packer game. This is me growing up, you know. So um, I never understood, because I'd say, Dad, you know, a lot of the other members of the church leave right after they take communion. Why can't we do that? He said, I couldn't leave without hearing the benediction. I said, I'll tell it to you in the car. You know, this is, <laughs> I, you know, it's not, but, you know. Uh, but I didn't get it. The benediction is God telling you, you know, we meet with God in his house. That, that's what's happening. But God tells us in the words of the benediction that he's going to be with us all week long. And by the way, what, what's his countenance going to be? What's his, how is he going to feel about us all week long? He's gonna, yeah, he's going to have a smile on his face. You know, I just spent uh, a, a week in California with my grandson and then uh, like five or six days in Indiana with my granddaughter. Um, even if they're acting up, you know what I feel? I just got to smile. I, mean, I don't even care. One, I'm not their parent. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, but it's just so much fun. And when, when they're being a little defiant, I think that's cute, you know. And, but my attitude, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what grandparents do, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, when you think of God, most of the time people have this view of God as a stern taskmaster, and he goes around with a frown because we keep messing up. Well, he doesn't like it when we mess up. Don't get me wrong. But a smile's on his face all week long because of grace, because he loves us. So benediction is God coming to us with, with a promise, a beautiful promise. All right, what else? What? Yeah, communion has been talked about. Yeah, what did you say? Baptism is, by the way, 1030 service of baptism today. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Parkland something, oh boy. Now I should remember that middle name, but 
Jean, thank you. It's in the bulletin, but I, you know, that's Karina um, Minton's uh, granddaughter, and she is so cute, so I'm excited about that. But yeah, baptism is God coming down to us. One other place. Ooh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's two other places. Sermon, if the pastor doesn't mess it up, is God coming, kind of like the readings, you know, trying to get his word into your heart and life. Um, now, why do I say if a pastor doesn't mess it up? Oh, it, it does happen. I, 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 I buy sermon books sometimes because, you know, I've been a pastor for, you know, over 35 years, and I can't tell you it's always easy to have a fresh idea for a, for a sermon, you know. When, uh, so so I, I read all kinds of other sermons. Mainly I don't have to buy books anymore. I just go online. And, and mainly I kind of get disgusted sometimes because you can have sermons that don't talk about Jesus at all. And, you know, one of the things I ask our, uh, our confirmation students, I want you to notice how many times the word Jesus is said. I want you to notice how many times the word cross is said. Because that's always at the heart and soul of our, of our preaching. And there are, there are pastors that basically say, you've got to do these things or else you're going to hell. And I have a problem with that. Because that's not a message from God. Now, God does warn us about the seriousness of sin. But there's got to be gospel in there. There's got to be the forgiveness part. So, um, yeah, pastors can mess it up, and sometimes we do. And, and quite honestly, there are times I look back, I try to save all my sermon manuscripts. I don't really read them, but I have them there. If I get stuck, I can read it, you know, and stuff like that. But um, sometimes I look back on some of the stuff I did when I was, you know, brand new out of the seminary, and it's like, <laughs> kind of embarrassing, you know. But uh, you learn and you get better. But pastors can mess that up. One other place, invocation. What is that? How is that a God thing? What is the invocation, by the way? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We start every, almost every worship service that way. Why? What is, what is going on here? We end with a blessing from God, right? The benediction. But we start with the invocation. So what is, what is that communicating to us from God? Well, it does, and it identifies, you know, you can think of, we're identifying, this is something we're doing, we're identifying that this is a Christian congregation that is worshiping the triune God. So that is a true statement, but that's not what God is doing through the words of the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When the pastor speaks those words, where is God taking you back to? You know the answer. When were those words first spoken over you? Yeah, in baptism. The invocation takes you right back to your baptism, and God reminds you that you are his beloved child because you were baptized in his name. His name is on you. Um, our world doesn't really get baptism anymore, I don't think, but baptism is this beautiful thing where God adopts us into his family. And isn't it neat as we gather to, in, in worship uh, around God he reminds us that we're his family. So those are the God parts. Now, where are the things we're doing? We're, we're communicating to God. And one is already the hymns, right? Hymns are us singing songs of praise to God. By the way, some hymns are God speaking to us. What? I, well, if it's, you know, some hymns are just uh, scripture put to music, more or less. That can be a God thing then. But besides hymns, where else do we go to God? Where are we talking to God? Prayer is absolutely. We're bringing to God. By the way, when we do corporate prayer, meaning I'm leading a list of 45 names. I don't even know how many is on that. I've never really counted them. Um, what is going through your mind? Are we ever going to get done with this list of names? <laughs> no, I hope that's not what's going through. What are you going through your mind? Yes, that's what I want you to be doing. You're adding your, your, your prayer to, to, the, to the words I'm saying. You know, it's, it becomes our prayer. It's just my prayer if I'm the only one thinking about those people. But if you're saying, God, please help them in your thoughts, then it's your prayer too. So prayer is us going to God 
um, beseeching him, praising him, all kinds of things. All right, what else in the worship service is us going to God? Confession, absolutely. Confession of sins, that's us going to God. What about where else? For communion, we kind of are. I think of that mainly as a God thing because he's coming to us. But there is truth in that because we come forward confessing our sin again. So, Where else? All right, I'm going to add something. What about offering? Yeah, somebody just said it. Yeah, offering. Who do you give your offering to? Yeah, it is to God. And one, one of the things, you know, for about two years, we didn't, we, we didn't pass the offering plates, and the offering would be scooted off uh, before ch the service got over so that uh, people wouldn't be taking money out of the plate and, you know, all that stuff. But m offering was back there. And one of the things that excited a lot of people was when offering was brought up to the altar, and there's a symbolic gesture that we do where we're offering it to God, and then we put it down. But to me, that's the key thing. There was a gentleman, and we're not advocating this, by the way. Um, there's a, there was a gentleman who uh, uh, came to church faithfully even though he worked the night shift the night before. And that's tough to come to church. And sometimes um, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak, and he would kind of doze off a little bit. And one time when he had dozed off, he didn't wake up when the sermon was over. He didn't wake up when we were doing the creed together. And he woke up as the offering was being gathered. And think of someone like Michael Tripp. Michael, you have a beard and a mustache. And so the usher was handing him the plate, and he woke up, and he's looking up, and he sees a guy with a beard and a mustache, and he was thinking, it's Jesus, you know. Well, that's pretty much true. Because if, if you're giving to St. John's to buy toilet paper for our 500, I don't know how many toilets we have. It's not that many. But it seems like a lot. When our uh, beloved uh, janitor was uh, recovering from uh, health problems and we had volunteers doing a lot of stuff, you never realize how many toilets there are here <laughs> until you're helping clean them. Woo! Yeah, it's a lot. But, you know, you're not giving to buy toilet paper. You're not giving to Pastor Johnson. You're not giving to our congregation. When you give, you're giving to God. And that changes that. See, for a long time, I looked at the offering plate as an enemy because it wanted to steal from me that which was mine that I had worked hard for. Uh, and quite honestly, that meant I was only doing what I call front pocket giving. So in my back pocket is my billfold. What's in my billfold in terms of bills? If I have a $100 bill, it's back there. If I have a $50 bill, it's back there. But if I have a $20 bill, it's still back there. $10 bill, eh, maybe, maybe not. But ones, fives, pocket change, that's in this front pocket. So, you know, and if, if, if you're given an opportunity to, to give to something, it may be a worthy cause, but you know what you're doing? You're taking it out of the front pocket because that's the stuff that doesn't cost you. It's the stuff that doesn't hurt. And it, quite honestly, it took me a long time to figure out, one, God's going to take care of me so I can be generous. And two, um, it took me a long time to figure out I really did want to give more. Not because I have to. It's not that. So that God can bless it. You know, you, you always think the, the little boy who brought his lunch for the feeding of the 5,000. Um, what was... And Andrew is the one who brought you know, the little boy in his lunch. So what was Andrew thinking? This will help a little bit. You know, it won't feed everybody, but it could help a few. And then God took it and made it <laughs> able to feed everyone. And that's how I look at my offering. I might not be able to do everything, but God can take it and he can do big things with it. And it changes how I look at things. So that's the two parts. And, and, and I say that because a lot of times people, when they go through a worship service, are thinking of themselves as the audience. And who's the, who's the entertainment? The pastor, you've got to have an entertaining sermon. Or the choir is part of the entertainment. If there's a soloist, that's entertainment. And, you know, and I'm here to be entertained. Um, that is not it at all. Who is the audience for, for a worship service? 
God is. You know, we're singing to him. We're praying to him. And by the way, he interacts with us. And, and the key to really having a, a powerful worship experience in a worship service is to recognize the unseen one. You know, Jesus made a promise where two or three come together in my name, there he would be in a special, powerful way. Now, I believe that promise. And that means even though we see pastors and acolytes and elders and choir and, you know, ushers, we see all those people, um, the key to, uh, to meaningful worship is to see the one who can't be seen, to recognize that we're meeting with God in his house so that he can bless us and lift us up. Comments or questions about worship? So I went from a broad definition, worship is everything we do every single day of our lives, to a narrow definition, talking about the worship service. Um, does everyone who goes to a worship service give worship? No. I, I, I have no way of knowing who does, of course. I will tell you, I think a lot of the times I don't give worship during the worship service. Why? I'm too busy being a pastor. And, and I say that this is m one of my problems. Like today, Pastor lagoon has gone, Matt's gone, so I'm going to do the children's sermon. I'm going to do both halves of the sermon. That's not stressful for me, but it means I'm thinking about everything i got to do throughout the service instead of having my thoughts on God. When you're an organist, your thoughts... So, for me, one of the great blessings is we have two pastors here, and some of the time I get to just sit and listen to God's Word being preached. That helps me a lot. Um, but it's not, it's not automatic that just because you're sitting in church that you're having a, a, a worship interaction with God. That's up to you to, to make it happen. It depends on are you recognizing who's here with us? And are, are you seeking to talk to him? Are you listening when he comes to you in the readings to share his word with you? Are you listening during the sermon? Are you thinking about Jesus when uh, communion is being served? You know, are you picking up what God is doing? Are you listening? Any other thoughts or comments on that? Okay, then um, we still got a couple more minutes, so I'm going to go into some, the next part. Um, scripture tells us, pray without ceasing. Um, that's 1 Thessalonians 5. Um, 17. By the way, you don't have to look that up, but I, I, I just pray continually is the, or pray without ceasing, depending on your translation. That's the whole verse. So besides Jesus wept, that, that's the other one that's the shortest verse in the Bible. Two words. And life is meant to be full-time prayer. So we're talking about life as full-time worship. Life is full-time prayer. So what does that mean? What am I talking about? How often does an average Christian talk to God in prayer during the day? Yeah. By the way, I once uh, surveyed an anonymous survey. Anonymous means they're probably more likely to tell you the truth. Because uh, a lot of times if our name's on it, then we kind of cover, we say what we want people to think about us. How many minutes a day did an average Missouri Synod Lutheran at Grace Lutheran Church in Fairgrove, Michigan, how many minutes a day did they spend in prayer? What would you guess? Gee, that would have been wonderful. It wasn't that high. It was higher than that. It was about three was average. But the range was zero to probably the most was 15 or 20 minutes. Um, but if you think about it, the average was three. So what is that? That's uh, three, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and one, now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> I mean, we're not, you know, and by the way, those are great prayers to use. I'm not against them, but that's not full-time prayer. So full-time prayer means on and off all day long we talk to God. All day long. It doesn't mean every word we speak is a prayer to God, but it means it's constant communication. So, for example, when I used to be a, 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 a district vice president and had to go to all these board meetings up in the D.C. area, um, every time I had a break, I called Denise. Wanted to see if she was surviving because, you know, we had six kids, and it's like, man... It's tough leaving her with those six kids. Ooh, except for Mary. Mary is the, the one that, yeah, Mary's here, so I had to say that. <laughs> but um, I would always call, because what did I want to do? I just wanted to, 
you know, she's my wife. I, I wanted to touch bases with her. I love her. So I, I'd tell her what was going on with me, and she'd tell me what was going on with her. There wasn't that we were solving life problems or anything. We were just talking. And that's how a relationship with God is meant to be. So when you're, when you're going around uh, doing your normal stuff, if you're watching the news, what should you be doing while you watch the news? Pray, absolutely. In fact, you, please pray. If you're reading newspaper, pray. If you're watching TV, pray. I mean, there's so much to pray about right there. Um, if you hear an ambulance or a fire truck or a police car, pray. I mean, if those, you see eight fire trucks go by you, you know somebody's in trouble. Pray for them. You don't have to know who they are. Um, when you find out, you know, you're at work and someone's telling you, oh, that uh, one of your coworkers is sick and uh, might not be able to come to work for a week or two, as soon as you find that out, say a prayer. You know, sometimes on Facebook we're going through and we see somebody's having a health problem, and, and it's easy to say, I'm going to pray for you. Do we always do that even? No. So I, what I do, if, if I'm typing, I will be praying for you, I pray right then to make sure that at least once it's true. Hopefully I'll be praying more than that. But, you know, all day long we talk to God for, for a sunset. Have you ever noticed how beautiful some of the sunsets have been lately? I mean, uh, wow. How about saying thank you for a beautiful sunrise? This morning I was uh, about 7.20, I guess. I was out in front of the, the sanctuary, and it was just beautiful out. And I started singing and was just singing to myself and God, I guess. But uh, I was singing, Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord from the, is that Jesus Christ Superstar? I think that's what it was from. Or maybe it's Godspell, one of those musicals. And, but to say thank you to God for a beautiful morning, for a chance to gather with his people, whatever. It's just all day long pray, pray without ceasing. If you love someone, it's natural that your thoughts would go to them. Let your thoughts go to God. If you have problems going on in your life or in the life of your family, pray about them. If someone else is having difficulties, pray about them. For the good things, pray about them. You know, for our, for our nation and world, pray about them. I mean, that's wildfires in California. Pray about them. That's what we do, ongoing. Now, I do like to encourage people to have a formal time of prayer, meaning one time a day. Maybe you have a prayer notebook and you write down key things you want to remember to pray for. By the way, that is helpful to have that notebook because otherwise it's real easy to forget who to pray for. So like on my computer, the prayer list for St. John's is on my computer, and every week I adjust it slightly, add names, take off names. But if I had to remember all those names, uh, we'd have a lot shorter list, I'll guarantee you. So having a, something that reminds you of people you wanted to be praying for, that can be really helpful. It also helps you if you're looking at a list where you see, well, God really has helped us. He already answered that prayer. He already answered that prayer. So, but I, I like to have one time, maybe tied in with your personal Bible study time, where you spend you know, five, ten minutes praying to God. Uh, praying about what you just read in, your, in the scripture study you did and praying about all those other things that are on your list. That, that's really helpful. But besides that one longer time, um, by the way, praying before a meal is a good idea. Yeah, as long as it's not just habit. You know, so when, um, when I used to ask my kids to, to lead the prayer, and we'd all say it together anyway, but um, come Lord Jesus be our guest, right? By the way, what's the next line? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let these, this food to us be blessed. Let thy gifts to us be blessed. I started messing with California. They say it different than we do here. And uh, with Indiana, they say it different than we do here. So, so I, I started saying whenever I prayed it with my son just to annoy him, let these thy gifts. Because <laughs> it, it's these and thy are used in different parts of the country. So I put both of them in. I respect everyone's. <laughs> but, you know, praying before a meal, Jesus did it. Why do we do that? We want to remember this is from God. He's taking care of us. He's keeping us promises. It helps take worry away. All right, we need to stop. So thoughts, comments, questions. So for those of you in the class, we did not quite finish full full-time Christianity. We will finish it next time and start the next lesson. This is lesson nine. Um, there's a total of 11 topics. 
So theoretically, there is an end in sight. When that is, we will find out, but ho hopefully in the next few weeks. All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word together. Uh, please help us to, to not just make you a part-time God, but to make you our full-time center of our life, God, as we live more and more and more for you. Help us to connect everything to you and our relationship with you. In Christ's name, amen.